All right, and welcome back, man. So, as I said, um, today's topic is basically about you know football or soccer sevens format. Okay, now we all know without a doubt, football is the biggest sport in the world. Soccer is undoubtedly like you can't doubt it. It is the biggest sport in the world. And proof of that, man, you've seen it. Whenever it's Soccer World Cup year, like this year, 2022, is Football World Cup year in Qatar. And, I mean, the buzz started last year already about the sporting event. You know, World Cup, man, I can remember, you know, I've got such amazing memories of just World Cup years and the buzz around it. Um, For example, I mean, the first time I experienced um, you know, a soccer World Cup buzz when it was in the year 1998. And, and even though, I mean, I was 10 years old, and even though I didn't really understand the magnitude of what was happening, I could feel, you know, the buzz. And this was the first time ever South Africa was in the Soccer World Cup. So I guess that's also what made it special, is that the first time I'm really learning about this whole World Cup thing, you know, South Africa happened to be in the tournament as well. And I just remember, man, the promos and the excitement, you know, artists releasing freaking songs. Um, I think if you're if you're from South Africa, you will never forget uh, the World Cup 98 theme, which was released by um, a group called TKZ. Um, You know, Shibobo, like nobody will ever forget that song. It became one of the most, you know, hyped, one of the biggest songs of that year and it was only a single you know it wasn't even in an album but it's basically because of what it stood for all right but anyway i'm not going to go too deep into the whole music thing um and then 2002 was also quite um a buzz you know by this time i was a little older i was 14 years old so now you know i was an athlete myself even though i was playing a different sport but now i understood what this event, you know, meant um, to the soccer fraternity and the soccer community. And then, yeah, World Cup 2006, you know, and as the years went by, you know, I started really, you know, getting into the festive mood. 2010 World Cup, that was the most epic, you know, because, you know, by this time I was also legal to drink. So I was able to, you know, really get into the festivities of the event. And as everybody can remember, 2010 World Cup, that was in South Africa, huge party. You know, it was a huge party. I never made it to the stadium, <laughs> you know, the fan parks, man, that, that's where it was at, you know. So um, after that, the 2014 World Cup, which was in Brazil, I didn't really watch it much because I was, you know, during that time, I was actually on my way to moving to Hong Kong. So I had a lot of stuff going on, so I didn't really get to really, you know, bask in that, um, you know, in that in that vibe, basically, of uh, the 2014 Football World Cup. But the 2018 Football World Cup, um, I got to enjoy as well. You know, it was really good. It was good to see, you know, France in top form because it sort of brought everything sort of like full circle because the first time I watched the World Cup, France won it. And then in 2018, when they won it again, it was sort of like, ah, you know, um, nostalgic slash full circle moment. But, you know, I guess everyone's wondering, why is this guy, you know, reminiscing on yesteryears of Soccer World Cups? The reason why I'm actually doing that is that I'm expressing why the 11 man code is so big. You know, soccer is the biggest sport and it's only focusing on the 11 man code. What we're going to talk about today is imagine if um, soccer or football, whatever you want to call it, branched out and actually really went hard at developing its other formats of the sport. And the reason why I talk about this is that I look at the other sports that I usually talk about on my podcast, which is, um, you know, rugby and basketball. The reason why rugby has been able to grow as a sport over the past, you know, a couple of years isn't only because of the 15 man code. Obviously, people still do get excited when they, you know, when they think about um, the Rugby World Cup, 
which is played also every four years and stuff like that. But what's actually put rugby more on the map is the rugby sevens. I promise you, I kid you not, it is the rugby sevens that has really, really put the game um, on the map. And, be, and it's because of the fact that the rugby sevens is every year. The HSBC rugby sevens is every year where international teams travel to different countries and they have a sevens tournament. All right. And because the game is so short, it's only seven minutes long. It's become, it's be, it's become somewhat of a, of a party vibe rather than the game. I promise you, a lot of people that go watch the Rugby Sevens tournaments, most of the time are not there to watch the rugby. I promise you, most of the time, man, they're there for the good times. And I know this because, well, <laughs> I've attended a few Rugby Sevens tournaments or two. And I can tell you one thing. I can hardly remember what happened, you know, on the field. It's more about the party vibe that they set. All right. But the rugby as a product is also entertaining because, um, yeah, it's, it's international. Countries bring their best players at the Sevens Code to basically entertain. So it's a mixture of everything. You know, you get the whole fan experience and it's much more fun when you watch it live. You know, it brings you know, um, live audiences, you know, it becomes a party, there's music involved, like it's, it's sports and entertainment. It's literally where sports and entertainment come into play. There's halftime shows, and it's just an amazing product. And that is why um, I'm talking about this thing. And then we look at basketball. Basketball has done the same thing as well. I mean, they're five men, you know, five aside, which is basically um, their normal sort of like code, of basketball that's also i mean it's pretty big but what's also grown the sport of basketball more and every time i go into the fiba website they're constantly talking about it as well as they're growing it is the three on three so you see even a sport like basketball has branched out and invested in another code of the game that they know um you know Obviously, with three on three, they're not playing full court. They're playing half court with only one net. So it's a shorter game. It's a shorter uh, format. You're not playing full court because let's face it. There are some, you know, players that were, you know, meant to play full court. And there's some who just aren't fit enough to get up and down the court. So they can only, you know, manage half court. And it's three on three. So it's just. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a different code, man. It's a different vibe. It's a different game altogether. Same rules. Well, I'm sure that they've probably altered the rules a bit. But the main point is that it's still basketball. You know? And the growth of 3-on-3, three three, it's just been astounding, you know, to witness it. It's even grown here in Japan. You know? I remember um, Anytime Fitness, which is the gym um, that I used to go to when I lived within the city in Tokyo. You know, I met one guy who had just come back from America. Um, his name was Naoto, Japanese guy. So I met Naoto um, at the gym. He had just come back from the States um, from playing college ball. He was playing college ball in the city of Charlotte. Um, shout out to the Charlotte Hornets, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so he had been playing in Charlotte and then he just decided to move back to Japan. You know, he was considering on playing some more, but then... He got the bright idea to actually start up his own three-on-three -three basketball team. In which, obviously, because he's still young enough to play, he's going to be one of the players on the team. But um, he's going to be like a player owner. <laughs> That's amazing, man. And yeah, he registered his team and he got a roster going. And it's just been great, man, to see his team. Just, you know, they travel around Japan just playing in three-on-three -three tournaments. So that's one of the good things about um, the three on three, like the, the shorter formats of the game is the fact that you don't have to play one fixture. Like you could literally enroll in tournaments because the, the games are shorter. You could literally end up playing what five games in one day. So you don't have to worry about having one day fixtures like, oh, we got to travel here and play one game. No, you travel here. You play in a tournament, 
And then the next week or the next month, you travel here and then you play in another tournament. You know, so those are the wonderful opportunities that the three on three game bring. And what I like about um, these shorter formats of the game, which is also included in, in the rugby sevens, is the fact that they give more players an opportunity to go pro. Because these aren't some, you know, um, amateur, you know, sort of like um, sporting codes for the sevens rugby and the three and three basketball. No, they've actually fast tracked these and they're full on professional. So you get guys that can literally, if they don't make it in the normal code, which is um, if you're a rugby player in the 15 man code, they can switch to sevens. Same as in basketball. If you, know, if you don't make it on the five-man roster, guess what? There's three on three. To the fact that both these sports, sevens rugby and the three and three basketball, have been included in the Olympics. All right. Last year, in last year's Olympics, which were named the 2020 Olympics, which were held in 2021 uh, because of COVID. Um, yeah. Three on three basketball was on the was on, was on the circuit for the first time. I mean, even though I didn't get to go watch it live, even though I had tickets, man, that's still such a fucking bummer. You know, I was able to to watch it on TV, man. It it was such an amazing product. You know, shout out to FIBA, man, um, who've really been instrumental in making sure that the three on three basketball really um, gets a chance to be fast tracked to growing. Because, I mean, three on three, I mean, guys have been playing three on three street ball for years on end. But it's only recently in the last couple of years where they've really started to take it seriously. I met another basketball player um, when I still lived in Nerima, uh, Brendan Striplin. He was also, I mean, he's from California and he was telling me that, you know, three on three basketball has always been big, you know, in, in the California state. So he was hella excited um, about the three on three man code really, you know, becoming pro and getting more of an investment from FIBA. You know, so, yeah, so I guess yeah, I, I wanted to, you know, f just talk about those two sporting codes before I revert back to soccer. And, you know, uh, the fact that shortening the code or creating or branching off into a shorter, um, basically shorter man code of the game has actually helped grow the game. Because basketball, I believe, pretty much comes after football in terms of um, being one of the biggest sports in the world. I strongly believe the biggest sport in the world is football. And then after that comes basketball. And it's the end... It's because of the fact that these two sports are always willing to innovate and branch off and really see how they can captivate the market. You know, but I feel that football has been a bit stagnant. Don't get me wrong. Soccer has, um, you know, other codes like, you know, the, the football, fut sorry, futsal, the futsal, um, that code, they've got beach soccer. And I mean, even though, yes, some of these games have gotten a bit of, you know, commercial exposure and television exposure, I still don't believe that, you know, they've really, that FIFA has really, really dug, you know, dug deep and really gone in on the whole investment, you know, of this, um, of the sporting code. And again, I'm not here to talk about futsal because I know that's really big in Brazil. I'm not here to talk about beach soccer because I know that's also quite big in South America. I'm here to talk about the sevens code of football. All right. Now, sevens, the, form, the sevens format of football actually already exists. So I'm not talking about something that doesn't exist already. It already exists. How do I know this? Because I witnessed it when I lived in Hong Kong. All right. So in Hong Kong during the springtime, well, yeah, during the springtime, which is around April, around March, April, Hong Kong hosts the Rugby Sevens tournament. And directly after the Rugby Sevens tournament, they host the Soccer Sevens tournament, the annual so um, Soccer Sevens tournament, which is hosted at the Hong Kong Football Club. 
don't look down on this tournament because it's it's actually quite um yeah it's it's actually got quite good credibility because you get some of the biggest clubs in the world who send teams to go play in these tournaments for example the reigning champs of the HKFC City Soccer Sevens in Hong Kong is Newcastle United so you know my point that I'm saying is that you've already got probably you know the top clubs in Europe sending teams because I know Aston Villa sent a team um Hong Kong has a team you you basically get teams from all around the world man teams from team that's you know teams that stem from probably the biggest clubs in the world you know so this is not a tournament that you could you know really look down upon it's a tournament with a lot of credibility you know so that's why i'm saying that you know i, I really believe that you know fifa should see this as an opportunity in expanding um basically the seven man code or branching off into the se uh, seven man code you know just think of the commercial success that this type of code would have would have because you got to remember one thing unless you're a die hard football fan no one really likes watching a game that's going to be 90 minutes you know so in having a shorter you know a shorter man code for the um you know for professional soccer you you're also attracting a different demographic like you're also attracting a different market like for example i know and again this is not um i'm not sounding wrong but usually um like your female counterpart i know as a dude like when you've got a girlfriend most of the time she doesn't like watching the full game you know, so you're attracting a different market when you expand onto the shorter man code. Because now, I believe because of, um, again, I'll revert back to rugby. I believe because of the rugby sevens man code, which is only seven minutes, rugby was able to capture a different audience. The audience that doesn't want to watch 80 minutes of rugby. And that's the same thing that football can do as well, is that it gives you access to capturing a new audience, an audience that generally, you're capturing an audience that isn't necessarily a big fan of um, you know, football, but they love it enough to join the party, which means that if they're able to go watch um, a Soccer Sevens game, which is possibly going to be only seven minutes, they can be able to join in the festivities. All right. I don't want to generalize and stereotype because I know that could land me in a lot of hot water. So I'm not going to say um, a certain gender doesn't like to watch the full game. No, men and women, because you do get some men who don't like to watch a full game of football. But they'll happily oblige to watching seven minutes of football and drinking. So that's where I'm getting at is the fact that football can really be able to capture a different audience, a new type of audience, an audience that isn't crazy about watching a full game of football, but will want to join in the festivities. And for them, watching seven minutes, that's nothing. You know, so that's a point I'm driving home. So yeah, man, just yeah, you know, the commercial success. And just imagine um, if now FIFA were to invest in such, um, in branching off and investing in such a code of football, um, and making it an international tournament. I mean, it's already big as a club tournament, but I feel that the, even the Hong Kong City Sevens, I feel like they don't get much exposure. Now imagine if FIFA comes into play and really signs the big bucks and spends millions in marketing and promoting this code. Imagine what it would do for the game. You know, just think of the commercial success now when it goes international. Now, we're spitballing here, you know, we're just throwing ideas out there. Um, just imagine having an international sevens soccer tournament in these destinations. All right, we'll start with South Africa. Imagine having a soccer sevens tournament because in South Africa, apart from people loving the 11 man code, what's actually gotten popular over the years, because I know a lot of my friends used to play this 
is the action soccer, six aside. So as you can see, a lot of people have been really, really getting into the shorter man code of football because it's action, the time is shorter, so the guys weren't fit to play 90 minutes, so they play a shorter time. Um, and people have really been getting into the whole six aside action soccer thing, especially around Johannesburg. All right. So now imagine um, hosting a sevens a soccer sevens tournament, in the city of Johannesburg, obviously, because Johannesburg is the economic hub of SA. So you'd have to have a tournament hosted there. After that, the Eastern Cape. And when I say Eastern Cape, I'm not just talking about um, Port Elizabeth, because I know a lot of people, when they say Eastern Cape, they rush to PE. Listen, obviously, they would need to probably have one in PE, granted, because they've got the Nelson Mandela Stadium, which is an amazing stadium, by the way. But not only in Port Elizabeth, if we're going to say Eastern Cape, I would love it. I would love to see it in two places. Imagine having it in the Eastern Cape, um, Port Elizabeth, and also in the wonderful city of Mtata, in the Transkai. You may ask, why do I mention this? You know, the Transkai in Mtata is one of those places that has become forgotten in what it really means to the history of professional football within South Africa. A lot of people forget that in the yesteryears, like late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of the talent that came out of the Eastern Cape was from the city of Mtata. You know, I'm talking about the Tabo Mgomenis that used to play for Bushbucks, Mtata Bushbucks, and went on to have an illustrious career playing for Orlando Pirates. Um, I'm talking about Patrick Mayo, who also came from Bushbucks and went on to play for Kaiser Chiefs. I'm talking about Cyril Nzama, also coming from Bushbucks, went on to have an illustrious career for Kaiser Chiefs. I could go on. You got Clement Mazibuko coming from Bushbucks as well. Went on to play for Mamelodi Sundowns. Became a household name in Pretoria playing for Sundowns. You got the Mugay twins, Wilfred and William Mugay. One ended up going um, off to play for Ajax. But both these guys, you know, they were, they were very instrumental. They were household names within South African football. You know, so no guaza. Like I could go on, man. The list is endless of top talent that you know hailed from, you know, um, the homelands of Mtata. So that would be one city that I would love to see host a tournament of this magnitude, and a city that hosts, man. Um, you know, international teams. Tata has a massive sporting history when it comes to football. And that's why I would definitely advocate um, for the city to be able to host. All right. And then obviously KZN. In, in KZN, soccer is actually quite, um, it's actually quite popular as well. I mean, you've got Amazulu over there. You've got uh, Maritzburg United as well. So, you know, yeah, Natal would also be a good destination Um you know, to host a soccer savings tournament. All right, let's move on to Japan. Now, in Japan, soccer is probably the second most popular sport in Japan. So it would make sense to have and grow the soccer savings tournament here as well. Obviously, Tokyo. That's, I mean, Tokyo, that's the largest city. 37 million people. So you've already got a massive market to promote such a tournament. Yokohama, which is just outside Tokyo as well. Um, Osaka would also be a good um, football destination and a football market. Um, Kyushu. Kyushu, mainly because of the scenery, man. It, it's beautiful out there. And they're also actually quite big into their soccer as well. So you got all those destinations that you could choose from. Obviously, you, you wouldn't be able to host it in all of them. But if you were to choose in Japan, definitely probably Tokyo and Osaka, you know. Um, Hong Kong, well, because that's where they currently play it, man. So, <laughs> so um, and obviously for the party vibe that Hong Kong brings as well, um, I definitely, um, you know, I, I, would, I would say it would be a success. I mean, it's already a success as a club tournament 
Sevens tournament in Hong Kong. So imagine what it would do for international teams. And also, I think they were very smart in how they created the, the Hong Kong Football Club um, City Soccer Sevens tournament in that they made sure to make it after the Rugby, uh, rugby Sevens so that it doesn't compete with it. And what this means is that instead of people being like, all right, I've enjoyed the Rugby Sevens, I'm going home now. No, they're like, oh, hang on. There's another tournament happening here at Football Club. So it's actually encouraged to, um, tourists to stay longer in Hong Kong. So that's why I believe, man, it's, it's genius. So imagine, you know, having the Hong Kong um, Rugby Sevens, Hong Kong Club Sevens, I guess running simultaneously with the Hong Kong, um, you know, um, football sevens with, uh, with international countries, you know, I don't know, they, they'd have to work it out. But all I know is just uh, because of the fact that it's already happening in Hong Kong, they've already got a market to work with. All right. And then next market, um, obviously Europe, because I mean, football, football's a religion in Europe. Dude, it is a fucking religion. So they definitely have to have spots over there. But, you know, in Europe, there's too many cities to, off, to mention. But cities that I believe um, would definitely be good to host, you know, um, a football, you know, soccer sevens, a football soccer sevens tournament. I would say probably Paris. I'm going to mention places that I've been to um, and what I identified Definitely Paris. Um, so when I lived in Paris, I lived, I was actually lucky enough to live 10 minutes away from Parc des Princes, which is the stadium of uh, Paris Saint-Germain. So I really got to see how the culture of football is in the heart of Paris. You know, so I would definitely, definitely advocate for Paris. I would say Paris would be a good destination. Milan. Um, simply because of the football history of Milan and because of the fact that Milan has arguably two or, you know, two, one of the two, I don't want to say one of the two, I would say two, one of the two biggest clubs, two of the most biggest clubs in the world, you know, Inter Milan and AC Milan, both clubs are massive, 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 massive. All right, and then um, if we're going to go Spain, funny enough, I would never say that I want to see it in Barcelona. If we're going to talk about Spain, I would actually prefer to see the tournament in Andalusia. You know, I don't know about you, man. If you've ever been to the south of Spain, you'd understand what I'm talking about. Andalusia is fuck it's beautiful but it's scenic you know and it's it's rich with history and they've actually got you know they've got quite a big um you know football following i guess the whole of spain has a big football following because in the south you got you know you got valencia you got sevilla so they're pretty passionate about their football in the south as well because i know when everyone talks about spain man everyone always rushes to barcelona and stuff like that to experience true spanish culture you you gotta go down south you gotta go to the south man under lucia because you also gotta remember barcelona it being you know spanish and catalan you know half and half nah we want the full spanish experience so definitely down south under lucia valencia um sevilla malaga you know marbella you know that type of region all right, and then in the U.S., let's look at the U.S. market. So if you were to have um, a Soccer Sevens tournament, definitely the city of Miami. I think if you're going to look at America, you'd um, first have to consider where you have the largest um, Latin population. Because if you're going to place it in a place where football is not massive, it could be, you know, a massive failure because... You got to think of it this way. In America, you already got, you know, um, American football. You got the NBA. You got um, ice hockey. 
you got baseball. So you need to make sure you position this in markets whereby soccer has a fighting chance of competing. So let's look at Miami. You got a bit, you got, I mean, you got a, um, yeah, you got a big Latin population of there because you got people coming from Cuba as well as, you know, just uh, Miamians in general. So, yeah, I'd say you've got a, a massive fighting chance. I mean, look how well Inter Miami FC, David Beckham's team, was well received in the city of Miami. So, I guess, yeah, so I guess hosting it in Miami, and obviously, man, fuck, <laughs> just look at Miami. Just look at Miami. So, yeah, so I definitely think Miami would be a good location to start off with. Los Angeles, again, um, and this is actually something that I was told by um, a contact of mine um, who's from Los Angeles. When I was getting started, you know, being an agent, I was like, all right, if I want to recruit um, good American soccer players, where would I start? And he was like, look, California, definitely. Because it's, um, it's also got a large Latin population. So because of that, you got more of a buy-in from the locals over there. A lot more support. So Miami, Los Angeles, because of the Latin population. Las Vegas, because of the fact that pro sports is t- like it's, it's really taking off in the city of Las Vegas. Um, as I said in my previous um, podcast when I was talking about how the show Ballers was instrumental in marketing Las Vegas as more than just a gambling um, destination. So definitely Las Vegas and because of the fact that um, they've got a professional team in soccer in Las Vegas um, who play in the United Soccer League, you know, in the USL. So having a tournament over there, you've got a market. It's going to get support. You're going to get a good turnout. And it's Vegas, baby. It's Vegas. Um, I mean... We've seen how much um, of a success Rugby Sevens has had in Las Vegas. And they don't even have a professional rugby team in Las Vegas. Yes, they have a few, uh, sorry, they have a few um, probably semi-pro to amateur teams. I know the Las Vegas Blackjacks, they've got that. But I mean, that is nowhere near as big as having a team in the USL. So the mere fact that Las Vegas has a professional team... I would say um, it qualifies as a possible destination. All right, let's look at New York. Again, um, cosmopolitan city. If you're going to put a team in Paris, Johannesburg, um, Hong Kong, Tokyo, you might as well also have it in New York because of the fact that it is a cosmopolitan city. All right, you'll find a huge Latin population in New York as well. And because of the fact that you have... Um, New York City, New York City FC, NYFC, and you've got the New York Red Bulls. So already, you've got a market to work with in the city of New York. All right. So I guess it's because of the population um, and because of the fact that they've got two pro teams. So that definitely, yeah, it qualifies it. And then um, a wild card destination. And I think it's because of the fact that I just love the city. And I really think it's one of the emerging markets of professional soccer in America. I would say Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia. You know, the ATL has become... They've also, you know, become... You know, um, how can I say? Atlanta United FC has also become quite famous. You know, in terms of really marketing um, their football to the public. I know they also get, you know, good crowd turnouts at their games. Um, I watched a few of their games during the MLS season. Um, And yeah, they had quite a good turnout. And what I like about Atlanta United FC, they're very smart in their marketing. In the fact that they're always um, bringing in like these entertainers, like you've always got these rappers singers, um, actors that actually make appearances at these games and they actually get like to ring the gong 
All right. So that's actually very good in promoting the team to the general public of Atlanta because you got to remember Atlanta, Georgia, man, it's a very big um, American football community, very big NBA community, very big baseball community. And all of their games are also constantly getting um, celebrity uh, celebrities at their games um, to attend these events. So I think soccer has been very um, proactive in that sense in making sure that, you know what, if they're going to be able to compete in this sporting market, they've got to get celebrity endorsements. They've got to get celebrity endorsements. They've got to get celebrities to attend the games and to make sure that these guys are seen. So it's not a fact that they just have these celebrities in the crowd. No, they make sure that these guys are seen by having them ring the gong. All right. So, yeah, but like I say, Atlanta, mm, it's quite, it's, it's, it's a wild card. It's a wild card. It could go either way. Hosting a sevens, a soccer sevens tournament there, it could go either way. All right. These are touch and go, um, touch and go assumptions about Atlanta, but all the other regions, um, because I've spoken to people from Miami and I've inquired about the football market and they told me that, nah, look, um, They've got, they've got quite a good following. Soccer is quite a good following in the city. Same as Los Angeles. I know, same as Las Vegas as well. Same as New York. I mean, basically, all the cities that I've mentioned before Atlanta, each have, uh, well, except for Vegas. Miami, LA, and New York. They've got two professional teams. Miami has two teams. Uh, one plays in the Major League, which is Inter-Miami FC. And then... Um, and then they've also got um, a team in the USL as well. LA has two teams in the Major League Soccer. New York has two teams in the Major League Soccer. So these are well-established football slash soccer markets. All right. So those are the commercial like possibilities for hosting international Soccer Sevens tournaments, man, for FIFA. And I believe, man, all of this would take the magnitude of uh, professional football to the next level in terms of how big the sport is globally. You know, these are my thoughts, man. These are my thoughts. Um, and just to tell you a little story of how I actually discovered <laughs> the Soccer Sevens tournament <clears throat> in Hong Kong. So how I discovered it was, so the day after watching the sevens, rugby sevens tournament. I was a little hung over because we had been drinking. So I was like, no, man, I need to nurse this hangover. So I was like, all right, let me go to Hong Kong Football Club because there's always something happening over there. There's always some sporting event. So when I went to Hong Kong Football Club, to my surprise, I man, I see, I see these guys playing football, but I'm like, yeah, but there's only like a few guys on the field. So I'm thinking it's practice. Only come to find out that no, and then I start seeing, obviously, um, the billboards and, you know, um, and all the promos that are on, on display, the banners and everything on display. I'm like, oh, shit, no, this is a sevens tournament, a soccer sevens tournament. So I sat down and watched, man, and I ended up having the time of my life. Obviously, I wasn't drinking on this day, but I was just amazed at the product because for me, it was the first time ever watching a soccer sevens tournament. And then, you know, seeing um, the teams that were there, because that was my first time seeing Aston Villa, you know, seeing Newcastle, I'm like, wow, this, this, this is legit, man. You know, the, the guys, they go hard, you know. And then it's only now that I've, you know, really gone into football where I'm thinking, no, man, fuck, imagine if they actually had this at an international stage. Imagine how big it would be and how much it would take the game of professional football to the next level, you know? So that's what inspired me to create this episode because I was like, nah, man, fuck, really imagine what this would do for professional soccer globally. Not mentioning the fact that this would really provide an opportunity for more guys to become professional soccer players. You know, so this would really increase the pool of, you know, professional football players globally because as it stands, man, I really do believe there's an oversupply of soccer players, but not enough structures 
to you know for the talent to go around and obviously teams are going to be picky teams are going to be picky you know soccer is one of those sports where i think in almost every country in this world there is a pro tournament but even that even with that there is still an oversupply of professional footballers you know so creating and branching off into these codes like the seven man code i really do believe would be very good in just distributing the talent and making sure that the talent doesn't go unused and wasted you know it's a win win for everybody commercially revenue wise for fifa um it's an opportunity for guys to turn pro so it it, it really is a win win for everybody it's a win win for us agents as well um because now you know that there's more than one avenue for your player same as what's going on with the rugby sevens now with the rugby sevens just a quick story they've launched a professional rugby sevens uh, tournament in i mean sorry yeah club tournament in america and this has spun off the fact that um america has been so successful on the international stage in the rugby sevens So this is the point that I'm driving home that by creating a um international tournament you never know what avenues this might open up. All right. So I just thought I'd share that man and just um share where I got the idea from so that people don't think oh oh my fuck what the hell's going on with this guy. <laughs> you know that it it actually is a code that already exists. Um the last tournament was held in 2019 obviously In 2020 they couldn't host it in Hong Kong and in 2021 they also had to cancel it. So I'm pretty I'm more than confident that in 2022 they'll make a return and we'll see if Newcastle United will be able to defend um their throne as the reigning champs. All right. So yeah man, so yeah if you get a chance check them out. They've got a Facebook page um City Soccer Sevens. you know check them out all right so um yeah man just thank you to everyone um who's taken the time to listen um to my crazy ideas <laughs> to my crazy ideas i hope i entertained you guys i hope you enjoyed the podcast um i hope it was informative for you um oh yeah just before i go please yeah don't forget man support uh, support the podcast by you know getting our merch which is available um online I'll post the link um on the description of this podcast and yeah man and shout out to my peeps in Uganda man who still support the podcast the podcast is still doing well in Uganda shout out to everyone out there um who's listening to the podcast and supporting the podcast and shout out to everyone everywhere in the world man who who gives the podcast a listen I really appreciate it and i promise you to always bring you guys um quality content um i'm always going to bring you content that's going to make you think a bit just like today you know because i'm sure there's someone out there thinking you know that is a good idea to actually for football to branch out and really invest in a non- in another code other than only the 11 man code you know who knows maybe this might spark up discussion If anyone from FIFA's listening to this, get at me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But um yeah, just to give, you know, the um, the FIFA peeps something to think about, man, because you know, football is an amazing product already. Um I'm just always thinking of ways that we could innovate the game and just give more guys an opportunity. But anyway, yeah, man, so this is Sports Biz. Um from an agent's perspective you've been with your host uh, Zila aka Chester Mbekela and i hope all of you have an amazing day man all right take care of yourselves and lastly i know i said this before but um i wish you nothing but the best for 2022 make it a magical one remember our slogan we don't only talk sport we lived it all right take care bye